it, it, there's not a fog in this room. I can, <laughs> it just have, you been, have you been smoking, Jimmy? <laughs> yeah, that's what it looks like. Uh, all right. Well, listen, uh, hey, guys, uh, thanks for hanging out with uh, me and Jeff today. And we've obviously got a special guest uh, with us today, the great Jimmy Parker over in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, a new episode of the Gold Ball uh, Hunting Podcast. And, um, yeah, we've, uh, we've struggled trying to get the technology <laughs> figured out this morning, Jimmy, which is, as I was saying, um there's always a workaround right it's like one of those tennis matches where you just can't figure stuff out and you're kind of going all right there's got to be another way to get this thing done so um <laughs> that was one of my questions today man was like <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> so jimmy thanks for uh thanks for uh carving out some time with us today and um so look, you just won. Uh, you just won another gold. You won the singles at uh, Laguna Woods a couple of days ago. Congratulations! Thanks. That's great. That's great. Um, you know, I'm the. I, I actually, I've got a question for you. I mean, the the obligatory, the standard question is, geez, how many gold balls now? So that is one question I want to ask. But uh, I've got a follow up question that maybe you've never been asked before. Um, <laughs> so, what's the current gold ball count? Uh, that brings it to 144. 144. Holy, holy. 144. Yeah, combo of both singles and doubles, and uh, and you just won the 75 hard courts in Laguna Woods. Beat uh, beat Fred Drilling. Um, my question is, 144 golds. Do you know how many silvers and singles? No. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me there's more than zero. <laughs> I, th I think I've got about maybe 50 silvers. In singles? No, just total. I, I don't. Okay. So, well, I, I, I thought this would be a great question. So I thought there'd be actually, you know, um, you know, some data that we could kind of pull from. There might be some, <laughs> some, some number of silver singles. But uh, is there one guy? Is there one guy who's kind of maybe got some kind of I wouldn't even say a winning record, but 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 some guy who's who's caused the most silvers in your singles? No, there have been so many guys that would kick my butt in the finals that <laughs> it's, you know, as you know, it's been happened uh, happened over and over again for a lot of years. I mean, I I uh, actually won my first gold ball in 1960 and uh no i guess it was 19 1958 somewhere in there but uh you know i've been playing for so long that uh, a lot of the gold ball silver ball stuff kind of happened without me really keeping much track of it and then i started realizing that uh you know i was playing now 35s 40s i started playing the senior tennis 35s but um you know, that's still a lot of age groups. And so um, I didn't really know, I didn't have any idea how many gold, silver balls anybody else had. And then uh, Alan Messer on his website, you know, he did this kind of count that was uh, to me impossible to do. But anyway, it listed all the top 10 guys in all these different categories. And so, and that's been pretty recent. So it's not until pretty recently that I really, made any effort to keep track of you know of what was going on but um what i did do is i had these little kind of goals along the way like at first i you know just wanted to win some you know and then then i uh i wanted to win as many uh, one of my first goals was to win as many as bobby riggs because he had been a great player and he was a senior player and uh he was a guy that i had actually my father and i played bobby riggs and his son in the national father and son way back and so so he was kind of a you know guy that I kind of set a goal for and then I started wanting to win as many gold balls as I was old you know kind of like shooting your age and, <laughs> and so I just had kind of these silly little uh, goals along the way but then when Alan Messer came up with all the stuff I knew exactly how many everybody else had and uh so that made it a lot easier. But I mean, like I say, it was more like I was just 
involved in the process of playing more than counting. Uh, so, well, Jeff, I know that, uh, you know, we talked a couple of days ago about that. Um, you know, it's the first time you've met Jimmy and, and yeah. that, that we've, or there, that you've actually got uh, a couple of students who, who are in Jimmy's age group. Right. And uh, it's really been, it's, it's been fun kind of yeah. listening to them going, well, here's, here's how to strategize <laughs> against Jimmy Parker. <laughs> and, and you and I are always going, okay, well, let us know how that goes, right? When you're right. And, and, uh, yeah, a little bit more of like, you know, maybe, maybe you can focus more on your own skill set rather than what Jimmy's doing to you. <laughs> right. How to, how to, how to, how to overcome Jimmy. So, well, um, I've been sort of hogging these interviews the last couple we've done. Jimmy, we just uh, finished one up a couple days ago with Phil Landauer. And, um, yeah, he's a yeah. great senior player. Oh, he's a great senior player and just a great guy. And then another friend of mine, Joel Drucker, who's, yeah, um, you know, a great tennis writer. Um, but I feel like I've been hogging those interviews. So, Jeff, <laughs> uh, I'll let you. I'll let you at least kind of start it off today. And um, I'm sure. Well, it, you know, you know, talking about you know, it just actually just a, a fresh question that just came to me while you were talking, Jimmy. Is is there been um, who has been your longest, let's, let's say, rival in this 144 gold ball career? Um, and it's continuing. Has there been, you know, one or two guys that has been, you know, like yeah. your, your yeah. Joe Frazier to, to Muhammad yeah. Ali, you know? Well, you know, it's, it's really interesting that I, uh, I just got through playing Fred Drilling. And Fred and I played for the first time when we were 14 years old. And awesome. <laughs> we have played each other in every decade of our lives uh, through a couple, of, like I've been married twice. <laughs> this is my second marriage. You know, he's got maybe got one on me there, but I mean, we, we <laughs> each other through all these things. <laughs> you know, when we had little kids, now our kids are grown and all that. So uh, yeah, Fred and I have played innumerable times and uh, I have no idea what our, one well, kind of head to head is, <laughs> but I mean, he's been, you know, kind of one of the few guys that uh, really goes all the way back. I mean, it seems to me as if uh, in each of the age groups, there's been a slightly different mix of top players. And uh, until just recently, Dick Johnson was one of those. So I started playing Dick uh, in the 35s and didn't yeah. really know him that much before that. but. Uh, uh, he and I played together, uh, you know, we played doubles together. We played, we butted heads in, you know, numerous <laughs> matches over the years. And again, I have no idea what our one lost is. I probably got the edge on both those guys, but I don't know by how much. But, I mean, I sure have lost to them on several occasions. So, <laughs> right. I would say those two guys are probably the ones that have been the most constant. Now, there are guys that, I think we're really good in certain age groups. And then for whatever the reasons are, they get injured, they lose interest, they, they pass away. I mean, that's happened, you know, unfortunately uh, more than I like to think, but I just feel so blessed because I'm still vertical and I'm still out there right. to play, still healthy enough to get out and uh, make the effort. And uh, it's not something I ever really thought about when I was younger. I mean, you know, I, kind of played the tour as it existed uh, back. I was really in a kind of interesting era because I literally bridged the gap between the amateur year and the pro and uh, played the first open tennis match ever held in the United States. I, I, I played Rosewall on the center right. court opening match of 1968, which was the first open. And so I got I'm, to play I'm, during that era. You know, I, I was playing right. Emerson, Laver, Stolle. Right. You know all those guys, and so uh, there aren't that many guys. When I look back at it, that were really playing the tour, then uh, you know even Dick Johnson has been primarily a senior player. So, uh, so it's been an interesting journey. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, luckily, you know your your you know your your first you know what if you want to call it your first famous loss bridging the gap you know bridging the gap wasn't an omen of things to come obviously 
uh, it didn't affect uh, you know the 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 outcome so far. So I, that's amazing. I think um, I don't know. So that just that just you know. For Jimmy, me, I know that uh, you know um, the thing you talked about is is um, longevity and and you know I Jeff and I have talked a lot about. Uh, about your style of play, which to me is just ridiculously efficient and the balance and posture and all that kind of great stuff. And, and uh, yet you had to kind of work through, was it a knee replacement the yeah. last couple of years? Yeah. And um, I just, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting to me that, that um, because that's not like, you know, well, let's go have a little, you know, uh, freeze freezer gun on my, on my neck with a little maybe some kind of skin thing. I mean, it's kind of a big deal. So has there ever been a time where you were kind of thinking, you know what, you know, I think a hundred gold balls is enough. Um, whatever. There's some number. I mean, has there ever been a time where maybe it was through an injury like the knee replacement or something where you kind of said, you know what, I want to do something else or I've had enough. Um, you know, I never have um, had that feeling. I, I, one of the things that was a blessing in disguise was that uh, shortly after I played Rosewall, within a month, I was in the Air Force. And I, you know, it was Vietnam, and um, I got drafted. I decided to go into the Air Force and fly airplanes because I thought maybe I'd like to be an airline pilot when I got out. I had no intention to stay in the military. Uh, but... I was in the military for five, six years, and that was during the time when I would have been playing the pro tour if, you know, if I if I hadn't been in the military. And so the guys that I was playing against in those days, um, I think all got enough. I mean, you know, they, yeah. and once they, you know, like the, the guys that I was kind of contemporaries with uh, were good players. I mean, I played, junior doubles and into the open with Arthur Ashe. I played with Grabner. I played with uh, Cliff Buckholz was from my hometown of St. Louis. Um, and then, you know, of course I played against all the guys like Ralston, Stan Smith and all of them. And they, they all became great players. And so, you know, once you've been that good, you probably don't want to lose to somebody like me. Because, you know, you show up at a 35 and over event, and I've actually been trying to stay in shape. And, you know, those guys are like trying to dust off the cobwebs off the rackets and they show up and they're going to have a hard time. That's right. You know, right. Some of the guys like <laughs> Johnson and, you know, other good senior players. And so I guess there's no, you know, real allure to playing senior tennis for any of them. And, uh, and so for me, though, I never got burned out. I never got enough. And so, uh, you know, I've always kind of felt like, gosh, I, you know, wonder what would happen if I had played during that time. But um, as a result, it's like, you know, I became a teaching pro. It's like I got a racket in my hand every day. I can still hit the ball. You know, I never really got my fill of tournaments. Here I am, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, all these years <laughs> later. Right, right. So, well, you know, I've, I've seen you play a lot both both singles and doubles and uh you know we've well actually we 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 played we the one time we played against each other um was i i did contribute to one of your 144 gold balls by the way um, <laughs> which was the 70 mixed a year ago and um so but you know look I'm I'm curious back then when you were playing, right? You play you play Rosewall the first, you know, it's a, and it's one of the all-time great trivia questions. Um, you know, who played the first match? Who was the first loser of the opening? <laughs> it's not the first loser, but who who played the first match? And uh, but I've seen you play, and your style, as I said before, is super efficient. Um, it's, you know, you don't bomb a big serve and then come in with a heavy kicker for a second. You're not, you know, you're not a Leland Hausman with, with the big thunder groundy off the forehand. Everything's ridiculously efficient. And I'm curious, was that the same way that you played? And I know that the guys back then in 1968 played much more strategically, much more tactically. I think you probably use the court geometrically a lot better than what we see the pros do now. Um, but 
was your style the same then as it is now? No, absolutely not. I, uh, you know, basically then, uh, most of us were serving volleyers. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and I probably came in, I mean, in, in college tennis, I would bet that, uh, in doubles, I didn't stay back a single time in my college tennis career <laughs> playing. Doubles. You know, I mean, I, I, I can't even imagine that I would have. And, uh, for me, I mean, I always relied on my quickness more than anything else. And, uh, you know, I'd always been kind of a student of the game. Both of my parents were uh, really good tournament players. They were amateurs, but they were self-taught. And uh, uh, I'm proud to say, like, they, my mother won more tennis titles than any woman that ever came out of St. Louis. And my father won more titles than any male that came out of St. Louis, even though there were some great players that came out, but they just were lifetime players themselves. And uh, so I guess it's in the DNA, but uh, <laughs> um, my father, I have to say, won the St. Louis City Championship 60 years in a row, 6-0. <laughs> Holy smokes. <laughs> and, I mean, you just figure, <laughs> you, you know, he didn't have a summer shoulder one year or something like that, but and that's of course age groups. I mean, it was open, and then it was uh, right age groups. But so the tradition for me, I guess, is just that you know if you like playing, you you keep on playing. But um, I, I think that, that well, yeah. I just guess when did you make that transformation from going as you said, pretty much serving volley back then? And I mean, you're you're still a serving volley guy in doubles, um, but but at some point. And I know for me, it probably happened in the 60s where I just, I can't serve volley all the time anymore. I, I just, I mean, I can still, I still do some in singles, obviously all the time in doubles. But was there a period in there where you sort of started to transform from just serving volley over to where now you're, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're truly an all-court guy now in terms of being able to serve volley and Pick your pick your times to do it, and and also work the ball where you know around from the from the baseline as well. Yeah, the uh, actually I had kind of an epiphany when I was in the thirty five and over. It's the first time that I uh, started playing on some of these teams and going to Europe, and almost everything there was in, on clay. And I was still trying to play like an open player, and uh, a lot of those guys, you know, they come to the net to shake hands basically. And so um, I realized that I, I was taking all the risk, you know, I'm, I'm, and I was still hitting top spin off both forehand and backhand and, uh, you know, trying to get to the net. And, you know, by the time, I mean, you can't really make the case anymore that by the time you're 37 or 38, that you're slowing down that much because Federer just is making a liar out of everybody. But, um, you know, there's no question that, you know, by the time I was, close to 40 that I just wasn't as quick as I had been and um, playing on clay it uh, you know I felt like I'm better than some of these guys but I'm losing to them because they're just so consistent they don't make errors they don't take much risk and so I literally started trying to become more of a backcourt player just to use more variety and uh, in the long run it's really been an advantage because uh, I can still volley but uh, as far as learning how to win points from the baseline, I'm much better than I was when I was, you know, the first half of my uh, playing career. So there was a definite, like, change. And I realized that, hmm. you know, if I wanted to play senior tennis, I had to start <laughs> getting used to the idea that I had to play like a senior. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, when, when did you, uh, when did you uh, really start to deploy, say, the drop shot as a, as a key weapon? in, in your, uh, is, that, is that in that same uh, transition or where did that come a little bit later? No, you know, I, I always have used the drop shot. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I was playing the tour, it was all focused on getting ready for Forest Hills. So the American circuit was a grass court circuit. And I, I basically learned how to play um, so that I'd be able to be good on grass. And one of the things that grass does is a drop shot, a good drop shot on grass is golden, oh. especially by the yeah. 
the old style grass, like now, if you drop shot at Wimbledon, it's not that much different than the bounce you might get off of a, of a hard court. But in those days, you know, you could hit a drop shot sometimes that didn't bounce. And right, so, dead, dead so, in the water, yeah. Uh, right away, I always had kind of a slice approach shot. And I found that I could mix my approach shot and my drop shot. It's a natural disguise shot. And so I've, I've been drop shotting for a long time, but uh, each division, <laughs> each age group up. <laughs> Until, you know, I think by the time you get to the 85s, that's the main way you win a point. Right. And so, 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 so been, it's, been, it's been part of your, it's been part of your weaponry this whole time, but exponentially each age group, it just, the, the count starts to go up a little yeah, more. Is yeah. that it? Okay. <laughs> I'm not proud of it, but that's the way it is. <laughs> hey, you know, everybody, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, I, it's I, a weapon to use it. I think there's, I think there's a couple things that, that I see that, and I'm talking about the 4-0 guys who maybe kind of came late to the game. And, you know, the guys who were getting – and this is really, Jimmy, sort of the, the group of guys and gals that we're trying to help. And I would say primarily tournament players. I mean, we are trying to help some mm -hmm. league players as well. But I would say primarily tournament players. Who are they getting into a round, maybe getting through a couple rounds, but they can't beat the seeds yet. And, I, and, I, and you've mentioned two things – that, that, that Jeff and I really harp on a lot that um, would help them improve their skills. They didn't have the luxury or the opportunity that – maybe they had the opportunity, I don't know. But, but they didn't do what you did in terms of your experience and in that era growing up where it's, it's primarily, primarily serve and volley. And, uh, and, and now the two things that I think that those guys really need to concentrate on, number one is, is, is how do you play a drop shot where – where you disguise it and and if you're trying to just play the you know there's so many guys out there trying to learn how to play a two-handed backhand and and then you know jeff and i are saying well you know the dropper jimmy parker um you know <laughs> it kind of works and i've got the same experience as you jim is that you know the last few years my it's a strategy yeah. it's just but you've got to learn i think you got to learn to disguise it because if you don't disguise it with some kind of a decent slice backhand, um, it's not going to be as effective. So one of the things is, is got to learn how to drop. And then the second, and the second thing is what you do all the time is you're playing both singles and doubles. And, and I think the double skills, even if you're primarily a backcourt player, I just think those skills are so important. I see way too many guys who are kind of the 4-0-ish trying to break into the national scene who are just 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 focusing on singles. And and to me, it's like, you know, here's another opportunity to get out in the court with maybe someone better, someone like yourself, see what it's like. And if nothing else, kind of desensitize yourself to these top players and and learn. So um, do you, I mean, when, I mean, when you practice and I, you know, when I asked you this question last time, uh, a long time ago when, you know, when we did another interview is, you know, what are you working on right now? And, uh, it, it, and it's kind of like, and I want to ask the same question. I mean, what is, is there something that, and I know that you had sort of a set of drills that, that, that you always did. But is there anything brand new? Not not that we want to give away any 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 secrets, but anything brand new that you're working on? Um, okay, so great question. About five things occurred to me while you were talking. One of them is that um, I do think that it's worth it to play both singles and doubles because it's all match play, and uh, I think the skills overlap enough that. You can add to your singles game by playing doubles, and you can add to your doubles game by playing singles. So there's not any set reason why you shouldn't play both, you know, if you've got the time and energy to do it. Uh, the other thing that occurred to me when you were talking was that anytime you're hitting a ball, you've got this infinitude of choices. And uh, I think that a lot of four O's, three fives, and so forth. Uh, they see the pros play, and they they see that power is predominant on the pro tour. And it's a little bit like a 
you know, public parks golfer watching the PGA yesterday. I mean, every one of those guys hits the ball beautifully. They can hit the ball 330 yards out there in the fairway. And, and yet that's pretty unrealistic as far as just how that applies to um, a club player's game. And so I think you have to be realistic about, first of all, uh, you know, what your athletic background is and how long you've been playing tennis, but also the fact that as we get older, our, our games look different than the pros. So if you look at a senior tournament, you're not going to see many guys that look like Federer out there, just as you're not going to see many, you know, public parks players that look like Kepka. So those guys are like freaks of nature. And uh, <laughs> really, <laughs> they are. I mean, they're in the upper, you know, what minuscule percentage of the top 1%. So, um, most of us don't have the benefit of, of that kind of, you know, kind of uh, DNA and genetic makeup and so forth. So anyway, you know, my point is that, um, but there are things you can do that allow you more versatility and versatility equals more tools in the toolbox to draw on when you're encountering a particular opponent. So one day you play, so let's say you play a senior turn. One day you play a pusher and the next day you play a lefty and the next now you play a guy that slices everything and then the next day you play a net rusher and the next day you play a guy that hits hard and the next I mean every opponent presents different uh, different problems to solve and I, I think that's one of the things that still engages me is that uh, it's still a challenge for me to come up with the right combination of how much do I stay back? How much do I come in? You know, how hard do I hit? How much topspin do I use? How often do I drop shot this guy? Uh, I got to tell you this famous quote, you guys will recognize Hugh Thompson as also a fellow drop shotter. And uh, his doubles partner told me one time that he, he was talking to Hugh and Hugh told him, he said, uh, well, I don't care if a guy gets to my first 25 drop shots. <laughs> so that's what you're kind of faced with is that, uh, you got to be in good enough shape. You got to yeah. be healthy yeah. in replacing your tennis. But, but here's what I would say: that every shot you have, you should be able to do at least three things with it. I mean, it can be real basic. I can go down the line, I can cross court, and I can lob. And if you don't have at least that minimal amount of versatility, then you are required to, then to have certain patterns that your opponent can pick up. And so Fred and I, for instance, Fred Drilling and I have played each other so often that we kind of know each other's proclivities, but we're each versatile enough that each time we play, it's just like a new combination. And you're, you know, everybody plays differently every day. I mean, if you put the same two guys out there on the court 10 days in a row, you're going to get 10 different outcomes. Right. So, you know, it's almost as if you're playing with a slightly different set of tools every time you show up. And so to be able to hone those tools in a way that allows you to stay back against the guy that that's appropriate against and still be able to come to the net when that's appropriate, to hit to the deuce court more often when you're playing the lefty with a weak backhand, to be able to drop shot when the wind's blowing, to be, you know, those are all little facets of being able to be able to find something in your toolbox that particular day that's going to work. And uh, so I think that I'm really, you know, just kind of stressing the idea that uh, you can continue to get better at your shot making. I don't care how old you are, you can get better at your down the line. And that's the thing I think that's kept me going is that I still feel like there are things, I mean, I, in a way, I wish I knew then what I knew now, no, no, because, <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm so much better able to deal with, I, I consider there be four main areas you can improve in. The obvious one is shots. So in other words, uh, if somebody comes to me and says, I need to work on my forehand, you know, I'm going to ask them, well, like, what forehand? Your forehand return to serve, your forehand rally ball, your forehand passing shot, your forehand approach shot, your forehand power shot, your forehand, you know, what? And so I, I think of shots as being more contextual in that they occur always in a situation. Whereas when you just talk about a stroke, that sounds so mechanical, uh, so stroke production kind of like, 
And so I don't really like that term. So you can keep getting better at both of those. You can improve your strokes, you can improve your shot making, uh, you can improve your ability to come up with appropriate tactics and strategy, you can improve your conditioning. I mean, even if you're our age, you know, if you go to the gym, you start working out, you start doing some of the drills that you can find on uh, YouTube or anywhere else, stuff that you guys uh, present to the guys that are listening to you. You, if you do that stuff, you you can get quicker, you can get stronger, you can improve your endurance and so forth. And the last thing, and the one that's been the most challenging for me is just the mental emotional balance because, you know, I, I mean, as many tournaments as I've played, I still feel stress <laughs> when I play. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you yeah. want to play well, but you, you know, it's such a balance to strike and it's such a flow to achieve and it's such a, um, you know, kind of a challenge to be able to balance freedom and control and uh, tension levels. And, uh, you know, you got to have kind of relentless optimism. And there's so these, all these pieces to it that I don't feel like I've still got a handle on after all these years. I, still feel like I'm getting better at it. That's interesting what you talk about with the mental side, because I think that's sort of the, the final frontier, uh, especially for senior players. I just don't think there's any, anyone really sort of championing the, the, or promoting and teaching that, you know, for the rest of us, that, that the mental part is so crucial. Um, and, and no one's practicing it, right? I mean, there could be some theory, but it's not like, you know, you go out and you play a match and all of a sudden you go, oh, okay, well, I got to be mentally tough right now. So let's see, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn on the, the yeah. mentally tough switch. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you haven't practiced it and you haven't really devoted you, and I think a lot of, a lot of reasons why players don't is it's, su it's such an intangible, you can't, you can't feel it, right? If you're working on a pattern or if you're working on the drop shot, I mean, at least you can sort of feel what's going on. But with the mental stuff, uh, it's different. And, you know, you've played, Jimmy, you've played in so many different situations. Um, I had a situation yesterday uh, where we played the finals. I played with Frank Zebo, and, and we were playing the finals uh, at La Jolla of a doubles thing and and we're 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 waiting for another guy to finish cuz um he was playing in two events and of course the rain had us all screwed up we were supposed to play at uh, <laughs> one o'clock and the first rounds now were being pushed back to three i still had a two and a half hour drive to go back from La Jolla back to desert and the storm blows through and it, it finally dries up the guy started at three o'clock but now we have this howling gale. Have, have you ever been to La Jolla? I'm, I'm, I'm sure you played. Yeah. Sure. And you know that club, La Jolla Beach and Tennis. Well, when the wind's blowing, it's just going, it's crazy going over the top. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and of course, you know, I'm waiting for this, this, this one guy who has to play in our final for him to finish up. They get to match point. They win the first set. They have match point in the second. They 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 chunk the match point and they eventually lose the breaker in the second. Uh, and I'm going, oh my god, man, this is crazy. Been waiting around. All they want to do is go home, right? And Frank, you know, God bless him. He's saying, hey, look, if you want to go, we can just, you know, don't don't worry about it. I said, Frank, I'm here. Whatever, we'll just wait another set. So sure enough, we don't get in the court till about five forty-five, and. <laughs> and uh and we end up and i ended up just kind of you know i guess i was sort of just sort of low on energy i guess or whatever but it's one of those situations where i said look i'm here let's just let's just give it a go let's give it a go and sure enough we win the first set and then i'm serving for it five four in the second get broken at 15 we break back frank serving for it at six five gets broken to love. We go in the breaker. They get a couple of lucky lead cords. We lose the breaker. Oh, no. and here we go. Third, <laughs> third set. And, you know, I think maybe one of the guy's kids was there or something. It was crazy. But anyway, so it's still blowing, and we have an umpire, and we're just trying to make sure the umpire's chair doesn't blow over. It's just it's blowing up a gale. And, and we, you know, long story short, we end up, we end up winning the match three in the third where we were down a break early, but it's kind of like, 
mentally, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think five years ago, I could have handled that stress mm -hmm. of kind of waiting around all day and, and, and sort of just waiting around and the weather conditions were horrible and you know how it is. I mean, you're not sure, well, do I eat? Do I, what do I do? Do I go watch the Milwaukee Bucks play? What do I do? <laughs> and, and, uh, and I don't think five years ago, to tell you the truth, which not that long ago, I don't think I would have handled it. But I think the last five years, Jimmy, and you've had this experience for so long of being able to, with all your experience, um, and whether, whether or not you've actually practiced it, because I've, I've not had anywhere near the amount of being at the end of the tournament like you have, where you would, you would experience all these different types of conditions. What would be the one thing that you would tell guys who are like a 4-0 guys um, who are, rather than, and I thought you just said it beautifully about the mental part, handling the stress. I see these guys, the 4 guys, kind of trying to really force, kind of force feed their game into every possible situation. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned, look, you know, there's so many different ways to do this, and you kind of have to adapt yourself depending on what's going on, depending on you playing the same guy 10 days in a row. You're going to have 10, 10 different, you know, kind of, kind of conditions. What would be the one thing that you would tell a 4-0 guy, here's what you got to really focus on, um, I guess, in the mental part, you know? Is there anything well, that, that, that yeah, kind of I mean, comes to mind? I think about? it's hard to pin down to one thing, but um, I always go back to simply staying present. And, uh, you know, the game happens in the present. The game is a great metaphor for the present. The ball is always present. And so what good timing really is, is being totally present. So that means that uh, – you're watching this ball as it comes in and you're watching that ball as it goes back out and so forth. And in that sense, you are both here and now. And so, you know, rather than having any kind of preconception about the way it should be, it's always what it is. And so, like you say, then um, here you are and you're playing on a windy day and it's cold and you've been waiting around and you didn't know whether to eat or not eat and so forth. Uh, when you get out there, I think to some extent, your ability to kind of establish a flow that is simply present centered is takes away all of the dead past and the imagined future. You know, it's like uh, you could tell you can even boil it down to a situation like let, let's say that you have an easy volley on top of the net on break point and you blow it. All right. So we all know that you're supposed to kind of get past that and you know, kind of take it from there, but it, it's hard to, it's hard to do that. And so I think that that, in that sense, it's a, you know, and it, it's an exercise that um, reflects life off the court as well. So that's one of the things that I really loved about tennis is just, it's such a mighty teacher and it forces you to do these basic things. So staying here and now is the way you should live your life, isn't it? I mean, it's like if you're always, you know, kind of launching off into the imagined future or you're always regretting something that happened in the past, you're, you're not really a, truly alive. And so I think that the metaphor of being present is so powerful that that would be my, you know, kind of one thing would be, look, it is what it is. You got to either accept it or not. If you're, you know, if you want to win a match, you better be relentlessly optimistic and that simply means right. you do what you can do right now and that's all you can do anytime whether you're on a tennis court or not that answer is the answer is one the question there that i had down here was like you know what do you focus on when when things have gone a little south in a match and they're not going your way and you know it feels like you got a frying pan in your hand and two cinder block sneakers on <laughs> um, you know, how, how does Jimmy Parker, you know, stay optimistic, you know, in that, in that situation, you know? I, I think but, it's still a challenge. I mean, it's not, I don't think it's easy for anybody. And right. you know, much as we love uh, the way Roger Federer has performed 
uh, you know, on a tennis court. I, I mean, I, you think that he doesn't ever have doubts? I mean, come on. You know, oh, I think you can see it sometimes where when you can see yeah. that he's actually battling that demon, you know, sometimes in his matches, you know, and it's apparent the way the ball comes off the strings, if you're really paying attention to the match, you know, you exactly. can see it. So everybody, everybody gets to, you know, walk hand in hand with that demon at some point, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really one of the allures of, uh, of sport in general and tennis in particular is that, you know, you get a chance to kind of deal with stuff in a way that is harmless to anybody else. So in other words, right. You know, whether you win your match or whether you lose your match, it's not going to change the world in any significant way, right. but it might change your, the way your inner workings work. And it might right. give you an opportunity to practice grace and it might give you a chance right. to deal with your demons. And, and so, and it does it in a way that uh, we can almost predict it's going to happen. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. you know, I, I remember a parent coming up to me one time and, and, she, and she was bemoaning the fact that her son, you know, had kind of choked away a, a tennis match. And uh, I said, look, you know, he wouldn't have choked if he didn't care. And the fact that he cares, he said, I, I said, people that don't care, they don't choke. It doesn't matter to them. So the fact that your son cares enough to choke is actually a good sign. He's got a chance to be a good tennis player. If he didn't care that much, I can basically write him off as a good competitor. So there are these aspects that have kind of a double edge to them. You know, right. nobody wants to choke, but hey, it shows you're engaged, it shows you care, it gives you a chance to deal with your demons. That's not all bad. No, no, that's, that's, uh, that's great. Great I insight. Got, uh, I'm just curious, Jimmy, being, being the number one guy uh, year in, year out, kind of the targets on your back there, maybe the targets on your chest, I don't know, one or the other. <laughs> Guys are gunning for you, and I'm sure that they're all – kind of working trying to figure out well how are they going to be jimmy parker do you ever feel that you need to kind of stay a step ahead i mean i uh, you know is there something that you feel that you need to continue to work on so that you know it's i don't know lack of a better term you're 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 still a moving target right rather than being stationary and they know how they're going to be able to kind of get up close to you do you have that sense that 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 you want to continue to work on on something? Oh yeah. Uh, to well, so, to to... Um, what I found in this little day timer that I've got here is a list that I made. I was coming back from the worlds one year. I was on the airplane. You know, it gets that's a long trip, and so I wrote down just from that last two weeks of play what I needed to work on. There are 17 things on my list here. <laughs> 17 number one things. Okay. So, right. so the answer, I, I think that I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of chronically uh, programmed to, I've always wanted to get better. You know, I just, that's just part of the deal. And uh, if you really look at it from a, athletic point of view, the trajectory is probably in the wrong direction. But there are things that I'm really doing better now than I've ever done before. So yeah, I, I mean, when you say, is there any one thing I'm working on? Well, here are 17 and that's just from <laughs> two weeks of playing tennis, you know? So, so the answer is if you're a 4-0 or a 3-5 or somebody that's just, you know, kind of getting their feet wet in the game, there are so many things you can get better at. You know, there's just so many things to work on that if you enjoy that process, uh, which all of us do, I mean, we wouldn't be doing what, we wouldn't be talking right now if we didn't. Um, they, there's just a multitude of things that, that you can enjoy the, the process of getting ready. And I think uh, that engages me as much as the actual play. I mean, I think I like the process. So each day I go out, I. I kind of work on stuff. And so, uh, yeah. you know, it's fun. What do you, you just mentioned that you feel like you're doing some things better than you've ever done before. Give us uh, give us one or two. Um, I think I regulate my tension level better than I used to. 
I think I'm able to emotionally be more resilient when bad things happen. Um, I think I'm better at diagnosing opponents, figuring out stuff, recognizing patterns and proclivities. Um, I mean, those are three pretty big things, but right. I'm definitely better now than I was in. And that's just, those, those aren't even really physical things. You know, they're right. I think I can disguise my shots better now. Um, I think there are some strokes that are actually uh, better than they used to be. And so, uh, what do you know? Uh, there are some improvements. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> Jeff, uh, I've got one more question, but if you've got some, something else you want to ask Jimmy, go ahead. No, I think, I think uh, what he just said is really, uh, you know, that's a great key. You know, there's some of the things that we talk about a lot and that is, you know, um, I think that, you know, in that three, five, four Oh bracket, uh, I think, you know, players can get so myopic in their look and, it's either all about, um, you know, the opponent, what they're doing to me, and then, or um, not understanding, you know, kind of blind to that. It's either one or the other, kind of blind to the opponent's skill set or blind to their own, really not understanding their own toolbox. So, you know, we talked about this recently in, a, in, a, in another episode that, that at that point, it really becomes... How do you even formulate a strategy if 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 I don't know what tools I have? Yeah, right. and, you know. Um, so anyway, I think that's really important what you just said about understanding, you know, your your own your own toolbox a little better, and then yeah. being able to pick up on your opponent's um, yeah. uh, tendencies as well. You know, so those things start to marry together, and you can actually come up with a solution that day which is going yeah. to be different than the solution yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Given what you've got. I mean, that's a great point because I think that um, some, of, some players tend to be so focused on their own side of the net, you know, Oh, my backhand's not working. I need to get more tough. Now. Right. I need more neck. Now. And they're not really observing that, Hey, their opponents having the same problem. They are. Right. So, they're not observing the damage they're causing. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, the half the match <laughs> is going on on the other side of the net. So, I mean, just that, you know, earlier we mentioned the word balance. I mean, just to achieve that balance of being able to kind of be aware of what's happening on both sides of the net is part of becoming a great match player because match players are just more aware and they, you know, like they notice more stuff and they can begin to right. uh, take advantage of trends in a match that someone else might not really even be uh, conscious of. So I, I, I really do think that, you know, the way you guys approach it, is right on because it takes into account so many facets of the game and somebody's going to practice, you know, somebody's going to get better stroke wise, but somebody else is going to get better uh, at uh, match strategy and tactics. Mm -hmm. And someone else is going to get better at, you know, getting past the mistakes they're inevitably going to make and, and so forth. So, I mean, it, you know, that's, I think that's one of the things that just makes tennis one of the, all-time great games because here it is we're yep. you know we're we're getting geriatric and yet we're still able to play the game and yeah. it has so much interest to it that you're never going to exhaust all the possibilities no. that's great <clears throat> that's great well listen uh jimmy one more question before we uh before we sign off here um talk about what you guys are doing with the uh, National Men's Senior Tennis Association, um, recently formed, I guess officially, what, formed about a year ago or so? Yeah, uh, um, yeah, you're in three months. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's happening with that? And, you know, kind of what's, what's, what's the purpose of it? And what are the benefits of becoming a member? All that good stuff. Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah. Our intention is simply to advocate for senior tennis and uh, the National Senior Women's Tennis Association was formed almost 40 years ago. And they've had a newsletter and they, uh, I, I think, really connect with each other in a, in a really positive way. And uh, actually the tournament that I used to run at the Houston Racquet Club uh, had six age groups too. So we run six nationals, the 35s all the way through the 85s. And what's great about that is that it brings all of the women of all ages across the age spectrum together in one place. And so they were real quick to recognize that 
you know, if they could form an organizational body that provided input to the USTA that, uh, you know, basically ran better tournaments that got, you know, people familiar with each other, that that was a real plus. And so it just took us a long time to do it. But I have to say that uh, John Paulus with Super Senior Tennis has been the standard bearer for senior tennis for years, men's senior tennis. And uh, he's just done a great job. And it takes something, you know, other than just hoping everybody gets along and hopefully the USTA cares about senior tennis uh, to get anything done. And the fact is that I think that USTA just does not do some of the things that are possible that would really improve the experience of playing senior tennis. So we're trying to come up with uh, formats that allow somebody who travels a long way to get one more than one match if they happen to lose their first match with Ron Robin formats. We're uh, just published a tournament director's manual that uh, it is made up of best practices for tournament directors. It's free. All they got to do is go on our website, tells them how to run a really good tournament, what attracts players to play a tournament in the first place, you know, what kinds of things do the players really see as being advantages when you run a tournament. Uh, we have stories about players. We've got reminiscences. We've got, you go on our website, uh, which is nsmta.net, at the net in there, dot com, nsmta.net, has a lot of stuff that really kind of just says, uh, you know, what we're doing. And we're trying to advocate, for instance, uh, for things like community outreach programs where we uh, go to a tournament and have the players uh, just basically make donations that we match as an organization uh, to a particular uh, tennis organization that the tournament director gets to designate. And uh, overall, our intention is just to make the experience of playing senior tennis uh, a good one. And the fact that the demographics are such that there are going to be more and more players of our age that are continuing to play and continuing to you know, be healthy enough to get out there and play tournament tennis. We want that to be something that really contributes to somebody's uh, quality of life. And so that's kind of what we're all about. But I sure hope we can do a good job of it because, uh, you know, the way I see it is that um, if we can provide feedback to the USTA about how they can improve things, that it would just be a mistake on their part not to, you know, not to do some of those things. So. Uh, I've loved senior tennis. You guys are deeply involved in it. We know what the advantages are, but I think there are a lot of people out there that really are not yet familiar with it. And so I appreciate what you guys do. Well, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, well, listen, guys, now I highly recommend that, uh, I don't know what my status of membership is, founding member or something over yeah, there. Yeah, you're a founding but, member. Founding member. And I just, I just did it just because – um, I really appreciate all, all, all the work that you guys are, are putting into this. And it's not just a couple of guys getting together and having a cup of coffee or drinking a beer or something like that and going, let's slap up a website. There's obviously been a lot of thought uh, into this. And, you know, the credibility with you and Larry and, and uh, Turbo and the other guys involved um, is, is really worth um, – you know, if you're a senior, if you're a senior player guy, I really, and I'll, I'll make sure that we put the website in the show notes here so that um, you have a direct link to go Great. get uh, uh, signed up as a, uh, as a, as a member. So with that, uh, Jimmy, uh, wow. Congratulations on the most recent gold ball. Thanks so much for spending time. I look forward to seeing you in Umag, if not before uh, in September. And um Jeff? Good luck over there yourself. Thank you very much. Yeah, and this is, uh, Jimmy, this is where Jeff really shines in our podcast. Every one of the episodes <laughs> right now, this is where he gets center stage. Jeff, take it away. Well, first, I just want to invite Jimmy. If you're, <clears throat> if you're passing through Detroit this summer, <clears throat> come see me at the Wesson Lawn Tennis Club. There are spectacular grass courts here. The courts are growing uh, grass heavily right now with the rain. That's great. Through. So it's beautiful. So I uh, just want to extend the invitation. If you're passing through, come see me. Um, otherwise, everybody else out there, please like us, share us. Please subscribe. Let us know what you think down below. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, thanks, again. thanks. All right, Jimmy. All right, um, Bye. Hey, Jimmy.
Bye bye. Guys, thanks for hanging out with us today, and uh, Jimmy, especially to you. Thank you so much for uh, for taking this time to be with us. Get out there today, help someone else, have a spectacular day, and Jeff, let's do this again tomorrow. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs>